so uh, this is where we left off yesterday. My goal is to get through this today, and then you study tonight, and uh, we will start the test tomorrow. Okay. Um, so the first one here says a rectangular room is two times as long as it is wide, and its perimeter is 48 meters. Find the dimensions of the room. So uh, the first thing I would suggest doing is draw yourself a rectangle and label what we know. It says that it is two times as long as it is wide. So if we call the width w, we know the length is 2w. Now let's talk about perimeter. Perimeter, we have to add up all of the sides of our rectangle. So it's two of these and two of these. So technically it's two lengths plus two widths. Or you can say width plus length plus width plus length, however you end up doing it. Uh, we know that that's 48 and that the length can be substituted as 2w. And then it just becomes a mathematical uh, algebraic equation that we get to solve. So what you want to do is you want to substitute one piece of information, usually about how they're related, into the other equation. So we get 48 equals 4w plus 2w. So 48 equals 6w. And then if you divide both sides by 6, uh, 6 goes into 48 um, 8 times. Now, that is our width. So our width is um, 8 meters. And then the length is double that. We have this equation we set up earlier, and so just double that, and that's 16 meters. If you add the two together, you get 24. The whole way around would be then the 48. So you should be able to check your math um, rather quickly. Uh, just make sure that 16 plus 8 plus 16 plus 8 gives you the total 48, or you did something not correct. Okay, So there is a word problem. We did those um, in section uh, 2.3. Uh, also in 2.3, we did a few where we had to rearrange the equation and solve for a particular variable. So let's do two of these. Let's do 11 and 12. In 11, we want to rearrange that equation, solving it for r. So all we have to do is divide by t. So r is just the distance divided by the time. And so you can put d over t, d divided by t, however you want to write that one. Um, for 12, there's a mixture of ways to do this problem if you want to solve for the a that's inside here. I think the quickest way to get something accomplished rather nicely is to get rid of the one half just multiply both sides by two. Now the reason that's going to work is because the entire right side was multiplied by a half so if we multiply by two that's going to cancel that out and so we get that 2a equals a plus b. <coughs> now we no longer need the parenthesis. The parenthesis was there because of the half and once we canceled out the half the half is not there anymore. And then we just uh, take off the b by subtraction. Now since it can't technically subtract, just write it as a mathematical expression. So I know 2a minus b equals little a. Now there's a mixture of other forms you could have gotten, um, but that's probably the easiest way to solve that. So make sure you can rearrange an equation. Um, I'm not going to give you anything more exciting than what you see there. Any questions so far? Okay. Now let's talk about uh, complex numbers and uh, some ways that we can uh, combine, simplify, and all that stuff. Remember that every negative underneath the radical is considered an i. So technically you want to kind of split this up to be negative 1 times 16 to remind yourself that the negative works like an i. Okay, so technically this is going to be 9 plus 4i. Now that's as simplified as possible. If um, this contained an i, it would be like terms we could combine them. One is a real number, one is an imaginary, so you can't combine them, just leave it like that. Now to add or subtract complex numbers, like we see here in 14. To add them, 
uh, we just can combine like terms. So in this case, we have the two real components, so negative 17 and 19 is 2. And then we can add together the two imaginary components. And you just treat it like any other, like of x or y, like just any variable, um, and so we get negative 7i. At that point, you can't do anything else. Leave it alone. That is what it is. You're done. Now, when you see a problem like uh, the 14b here, the subtraction, uh, please make sure to distribute that negative to both pieces before you combine like terms. So we would get negative 17 minus 5i. There was nothing in front of that parenthesis. But the back piece becomes negative 19 plus 2i. So make sure that you're combining your like terms. So our 17, which is negative, and our 19, which is negative, becomes um, negative 34. And then we've got our two um, i's here. One is negative and one is positive, so subtract and then keep the sign of the larger absolute value. So um, just combine them like they are like terms, like one's a variable has an x on it and one doesn't, and you'll be fine. Now, in 15, we are going to start using multiplication. Um, first thing you want to do is distribute and just treat it like it's a normal variable. Just distribute, see what you get. You get negative 40i minus 10i squared. Now, the thing to remember, the fact that you want to have memorized is that i squared is equivalent to negative 1. So when we see this has a negative or an i squared on it, think of it as multiplying whatever it's touching by negative 1. So this is really negative 10 times negative 1. So technically here we have a negative 40i plus 10. Now those are not like terms, so leave it. Uh, technically, the order, usually you write the real component first, followed by the imaginary component. But if you have this as an answer, that's perfectly correct. Uh, if you want to rearrange it so it looks more in the precise order, you can do that too. So i squared equals negative 1. That's the fact you want to remember for doing a problem like 15. You treat it just like it's a variable, but if you get an i squared, replace it with negative 1. Now for 16, because we have two um, parentheses touching here, um, to perform that multiplication, you do it just like you would if it was any other variable. We're going to distribute. So we're going to multiply the 12 to both things, and then we're going to multiply the negative 2i to both things. Okay, so let's do that part. When you do that, you get negative 36 um, plus 72i plus 6i minus 12i squared. Now, usually, there's an i squared that will now be on the end piece. Now, remember how an i squared works. Remember, that is the same as negative 12 times negative 1. So that's really going to be a plus 12. So remember, whatever the i squared touches, it changes its sign. So if we combine the like terms now, negative 36 plus 12 is negative 24. And then our uh, i's are like terms. 72i plus 6i is a total of 78i. Okay. So if you get an i squared, turn it into a negative 1 and go from there. So that's 16. Uh, any questions so far about 15 or 16? Okay. Or 17. If you have an imaginary in a denominator, um, what you're going to do is surround uh, the top or bottom, if it has more than one term, with parentheses. And all we have to do is multiply by the opposite of the i. So just a negative i will fix everything. Okay. Now you could have put, uh, remember conjugates, we have 7i and negative 7i. 
You can do the sevens. The sevens will cancel out. So, but, um, and that only works if it's just an imaginary component under there. Okay. Now, let's distribute on top. We get negative 2i minus 1i squared. We'll fix that in a minute. And then we get negative 7i squared. Now, you'll end up with some i squareds in the problem. But remember, what is i squared equivalent to? Negative 1. So whatever it's touching, plan on switching signs. So that becomes a plus 1, and that becomes a plus 7. So um, that negative i makes a positive denominator, which is good. Okay, so now let's rewrite it. Let's put our real component first. So that's a 1 minus 2i all over 7. Now that is perfectly correct. You can stop there. I'm okay with you stopping there. That's perfectly fine. If you want to split it up and make it look a little more like an actual complex number, you could split it up to be 1 7 minus 2 7 i. But this is okay as well. Okay. So I'm okay you stop in here, but if you like to split it up, you can. Just make sure the 7 is going into both pieces, not just one. Any questions about 17? Okay. Now, for 18, the difference here is we have not just an imaginary um, number like in 17, but we actually have a complex number. So put it in parentheses. And here we have to use the conjugate. So the conjugate of the bottom is what we have to use. And so the conjugate of the bottom is 5 minus 2i. Okay, so we're going to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of the bottom if there's a complex number down there. Now, the bottom should work out nicely. So let's do the bottom first. We're going to distribute just like before. Distribute the 5, distribute the 2i. Let me show you what we get. We get 25 minus 10i plus 10i minus 4i squared. So every time you multiply by conjugates, these two should cancel out. Then these two should combine to be just normal numbers. So those two will make a normal number. Now, remember this part technically is negative 4 times negative 1 or plus 4. So we know now that the bottom is just a number and it happens to be the number 29. So if you don't get a singular real number in the denominator, you have not used the conjugate correctly. The i should not be in the problem anymore um, after you get to this point. Okay, now on top, we have to distribute that negative 24, and then we have to distribute the 31i. So let's do that. Okay, so we get negative 120 plus 48i plus um, 155i minus 62i squared. Now, just like earlier when I said this bottom piece should always have an i squared on it, this piece should have an i squared on it too. So that's going to become a plus 62. And then combine what you got. And so we get negative 58. And then if you add up the i's, 48 plus 155 is 203 i. Um, what's really interesting about this problem is the front piece is divisible by 29 exactly, but so is the back. They're both divisible by 29. So this is one where dividing by 29 is very, very helpful. 58 divided by 29 is 2, so we're left with a negative 2 in the front. 203 actually is divisible by 29 also 7 times. So if we simplify it, just divide both pieces by 29, um, and it does work out really nice. Negative 2 plus 7i. Okie dokie. Any questions um, about 18?
Okay, so let's compare one last time before we move on. For 17, if it's just a uh, singular i, just multiply top and bottom by negative i. But if it is an actual complex number with a real and imaginary piece, use the conjugate. Distribute on top and bottom. This technically is correct, but if both pieces are divisible by 29, you should tr try that because if it does, look at the answer, we get a much nicer answer. Any questions about the complex operations? Okay. 2.5 was about solving equations, especially quadratics. Um, on the test, I did not specify what method that we used. On here, they, we, they do specify, but on, on the test, I just said solve these. You solve them however you want. Now remember, all of these are solvable using the quadratic formula. So if all else fails and you look at one and you go, I don't know how to solve it, just throw it into the quadratic formula. Um, let's, is there any on here that says quadratic? Yeah, okay. So let's start with uh, 19 and 20. They say to solve by factoring. You always look for a greatest common factor. In 19, both of those pieces have an X in them, so take out an X. So if they have something in them, take that out. And then remember, you split it up and you set the first factor equal to zero, the second factor equal to zero, and you solve. So the answers here are zero or six. Now, for 20, there isn't a greatest common factor, so we have to do the trick. Is there uh, two things that multiply to give us 63 that add up to 16? Well, that would be 9 and 7. So 9 times 7 is 63, um, but uh, they add up to the 16 that's in the middle. Now, remember, once you split it apart, you can set each individual factor equal to 0, and then you solve each one independently. So we get answers of negative 9 or negative 7. So always try to factor it. Um, if you can factor it, you can solve it. Okay. Now, the square root property, again, I did not specify, but I did put two of these on here that look very similar to what you see here. Um, if you just have a squared term only, the square root property says you can get that thing by itself. If there's a front coefficient, divide it off. And we get that m squared equals negative 75. Now, what's going to get rid of a square? Square root. That's why it's called the square root property. And so m is plus or minus the square root of negative 75. Okay. Now, here it says determine all real solutions. For the test, I just said to solve it. I want you to solve it whether or not it's a real answer or it's a screwed up one like this one um, that has an i in it. Because we know how to simplify that, so let me remind you how to simplify that. We want to take out the negative 1, because remember, that's going to be an i. Think about perfect squares that are living in the number 75. That's 25 times 3. So technically, we can take the square root of this piece and this piece, and we leave a 3 back behind. So the final answer would be uh, plus or minus 5i times the square root of 3. So that is 21a. We'll call that 21a. Now, for 21b, <coughs> it's the same exact procedure. You only have a u squared, so get that by itself. Divide off the 3. And then u is going to be plus or minus that square root. Now, if it's a perfect square root, like 25 or 49, take the square root. Um, 72 is not, but think about the largest thing that's in 72 that is a perfect square. Well, 72 is 36 times 2. 
So 36 is a nice perfect square. Now, if you don't see 36 is in there, but you see, oh, I know four goes into it, and then eventually a nine would go into it. You know, you could just take out pieces at a time. The largest is the quickest way to take it out because I know the square root of 36 is six. So that's plus or minus six square root of two. So if you have just a u squared, you can uh, do this method. You can also factor it. We could also try to uh, factor out the three and then it'd be still plus or minus the square root of 72, however you end up doing it. So that's another method you can use. Now, if all else fails for a problem like 22, um, you can just use the quadratic formula. So let's do one with the quadratic formula um, uh, so that you can remember how to do that. Now tomorrow, um, when you take the test, I'm not going to uh, give you the quadratic formula, so make sure you know it. So if you want to write it down you know, uh, on your paper, like as soon as you get your paper, that's, that's good. Let me remind you what it is. So it's uh, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2as. Okay, now in this particular one, our a value is negative 10, our b value is negative 18, and our c value is 4. Now the quadratic formula is not the most efficient way to solve. Uh, if you want to solve this and it's factorable, factoring is the way you really want to go. It's going to be the quickest way. Um, but let's go ahead and plop this into the formula. So negative b comes first in the formula. I always think of that as the opposite of b. So the opposite of negative 18 is positive 18. The next thing that comes into the formula is b squared. Now what I do is I technically actually do b squared on a calculator or in my head or wherever. 18 squared is 324. The next thing I do on my calculator is negative 4 times a times c because that comes next. So negative 4 times negative 10 times positive 4. I just did negative 4 times a times c is positive 160. And two a's is negative 20. Now get a singular value inside that square root before you try to do anything else. So that's 18 plus or minus the square root of 484 divided by negative 20. And then you have to ask yourself, is there a way to take the square root of 44. Is it a perfect square? I always would put it into a calculator to see. It actually is 22 times 22. So the square root of that is actually 22. Now, when math teachers say the quadratic formula, the, the math, math teachers always say all over 2a. The reason they say that is you want, they want to remind you that they, you want to get an answer before you divide by that all over thing. Okay. So at this point, you want to do 18 plus 22. 18 plus 22 is 40. So the first one would be 40 divided by negative 20. The next one's going to be 18 minus 22, which is um, negative 4 divided by 20. So once you get those um, two distinct fractions, okay, so all I did was 18 plus 22, that's where I got the 40, and then I did 18 minus 22, and that's where I got the negative 4, I'm sorry, over negative 20. <coughs> once you've gotten to this point, reduce the fractions as much as you can, and that's your final answers. The first answer, 40 divided by negative 20 is negative 2. The second answer, the two negatives should cancel. 4 goes into 25 times, so that's 1 over 5. So that is the quadratic uh, formula. You can solve every quadratic using it. Do you have to know if it's factorable? So I always go, is it factorable? That's what I'm going to do. If it's not factorable, I use the quadratic formula. Um, skip 23 and 24.
don't worry about those. It's the same same kind of thing. And I didn't put on one that's quite like that one on there. So skip 23 and 24. And now let's do some uh, of the equations we see here. Now, 2.6 was about uh, kind of more complicated equations, some different types of equations. Um, first, let's take a look at our equations that are just uh, absolute value equations. So let's look at 25. For an absolute value equation, remember we have two cases. We have the positive case and we have the negative case. For the positive case, just rewrite the thing again without absolute values. In this case, just use parentheses. But the negative case, you're going to write it again with the numerical side flipping to a negative. So the cases are when does that absolute value thing equal a positive 12? When does that absolute value thing equal a negative 12? And then you just solve. Um, you can divide by the 4 or you can distribute whichever way you want. I'm going to divide off by 4. And then uh, add 8, divide by 9, you got it. Okay, so the first one, if we add 8, we get 11. And when we divide by 9, we just get a fraction. Just leave it a fraction. Don't worry about doing anything else. It is what it is. Now, the second, the negative case when we add 8, this time we get 5. And then if we divide off the 9, this time we get 5 over 9. Okay. So uh, remember, absolute value equations have a positive case and a negative case. They're just two simple equations after that. Uh, don't make them more difficult than you have to. Okay, so 25, absolute value equation, positive case, negative case, go. Okay. Now, for 26, um, you want to get the absolute value by itself. We're going to do that by adding 2 to both sides, not the absolute value, the square root by itself. We get the square root of x plus 8 equals 8. Now, if you get the square root equals a positive number, keep going. The square root will never equal a negative. So if at this point you got it equal to a negative, you would stop and go, hey, I can't keep going. It doesn't work. But if you get to this point, you're ready to go because we can just square both sides. Now, there's no plus or minus anything because it's just the answer to that is a positive thing. And so you get x plus 8 equals 64. And you get a much simpler equation at that, this point. Subtract 8 from both sides. You get x equals um, 56. Okay? So that's how you would do one of it like that. Now, one like 27 requires a little more work on our part because we have an x both in the radical and an x outside of the radical. We're still going to use the same technique I did right here. We still are going to square both sides. Okay. If we square both sides, here's the part that can throw you. The square and the square root cancel. So this side, just things cancel. So that's nice. But the right side, you want to think about that as x plus 10 times x plus 10. We do have to actually FOIL and distribute. So that's what can throw people. Okay. So now let's continue uh, by actually distributing that. We get x squared. Now we're going to, I'm going to do a shortcut here just because of room over here, but you're going to get a 10x, then you're going to get another 10x, so we're going to get a total of 20x's, and then 10 times 10, which is 100. Now if you see squares in your brain, please think quadratics, and I know how to solve quadratics, either factor or use the quadratic formula. So at this point, we need it equal to zero. That we only solve those things if it's equal to zero. So we're going to have to subtract x 
and subtract 120 from both sides. And we get x squared plus 19x minus 20. And that is a factorable quantity. So that factors to be x uh, plus 20 and x minus 1 because 19 uh, is 20 minus 1. 20 times 1 is the 20 on the end, you know, all that good stuff. Okay. Now remember, to solve that, we're not done until we've split it apart. We set each one equal to zero. We solve each one. Now, here is where these get tricky, weird, strange, whatever. You must check these because if you plug them back into the original form, now I'm going to erase so we can look at the original form. And you can check them in your brain. You don't have to check them on paper, but you should check them. Watch when we plug in negative 20. I get that the square root of 100 equals negative 10. Does the square root of 100 equal negative 10? No. Does it equal positive 10? Yes. Does it equal negative 10? Nope. So this one is out off the table. It doesn't work in the original form. So square roots can get what's called an erroneous solution. It seems like it should work, but when you plug it back in, it doesn't. So just take two seconds, plug it back in, and go, does it work? Now, let's try one. I get 121. The square root of that is 11. Is 11 1 plus 10? It sure is. So this one is fine. One works, but negative 20 doesn't. Some equations you don't have to check. There's nothing that's going to really mess it up. But square root equations are something that can get messed up very easily. So please, 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 for ones like 27 and 28, whatever you get, just plug back into the original, make sure it works. Now, 28's a little easier. The reason 28's a little easier is we can just square both sides. Be careful about that three. That three in front has to be squared. What is three squared? 9. So technically, there is a 9 in front of that square root when we square it. And then the other side didn't have anything there, so it's just 4n plus 60. So if there's something in front, when you square it, that has to be included in that process or it doesn't work. Now it's just a simple equation. Let's go ahead and actually just solve it. We're going to distribute. Once we distribute the 9, it's just an equation. Get the m's to one side, the numbers to another. If I subtract 4 m's from both sides, I get 50 m. If I subtract 45, I get 15. And then divide by 50 and we're done. Now, um, that isn't a nice number, but what's a number that divides equally into 15 and also into 50? Five. Five. So why not reduce it? Just reduce it for me as much as you can in this top. If I divide both of those by 5, I get 3 over 10. Now, the last square root I told you to check. This one you should check as well. Um, if you put 3 tenths in here and 3 tenths in here, they do, it does work. The ones that have like something in a square root and something outside of a square root are the ones that are most suspect of causing an issue. And so that one does work in the original. Okay. Um, uh, let's keep going here. Um, so for 29, you might notice that our highest power is a 3. When you see that, Check, check, check to see if it's a factorable quantity first. And you always look for that greatest common factor. What goes into each of those numbers? M is, so there's an M in there, and what else? Two, and there's actually a high, one higher number that goes into it. Four goes into 96, 44, and 4. So we can take out not only the M, but take out a 4. Now, if you took out a 2, there's nothing wrong with that. It would work. Uh, you just might find another two later on. But anyway, so let's take out 4M. Remembering, 
factor in is the most efficient tool to solve an equation. Factoring is the most efficient tool to solve an equation. Okay, so we're going to get m squared plus 11m plus uh, 24. And then you have to ask yourself, can I keep going with this? You know, if not, you could solve that with the quadratic formula. There's lots of ways to go here. And that's m plus 8 and m plus 3. And now, once we have factored thoroughly, then remember, each piece gets its own equal to 0, and we get to solve. And so we get 4m equals 0, m plus 8 equals 0, m plus 3 equals 0. So you just solve each one independently, and there you go. Now the first one, if you divide by 4, you still get 0. The second one, we subtract 8. The second one, we subtract 3. And so we get three nice answers, and that's very common that if your highest power is a 3, odds are we're probably going to get three answers. Okay. Um, 30... I'm not going to say too much about that one just yet. I didn't put one like this on there. I, maybe a bonus or something, but that's a grouping problem. So take out something that's common to the group. So there's a T plus 3 hiding in there. And if we have time, I'll come back to it. Uh, skip 31. I didn't put one on there like that. Okay, now let's talk about 2, 7. Like I said, if we have time, I'll come back to 30. We might have time. Okay. Uh, 2, 7, the last section that we have done is about any inequalities. Um, I want you to uh, give me all your final answers for this section uh, in interval notation. Okay, so let's talk, talk about 32. It says solve the following inequalities. So you just subtract 2 from both sides. When do we actually have to worry about flipping over the symbol? Multiplying or dividing by a negative, exactly. So that's where we have to worry about it. We did not do this here. Subtraction doesn't change the symbol. So we get b is less than 1. So if you were to graph it, let's go to the graphing part first. We're going to have an open circle at 1. And we're going to shade everything that is less than it to the left. Less than left. Okay. Now, I want that in interval notation. So uh, if you follow the number line, my leftmost point is negative infinity. My rightmost point is 1. Am I able to include 1 in the answer? Does it have the equal to on it? So that means everything right up to 1. So 0.99999 works, but 1 doesn't, okay? So the way that you write that in our interval notation is I want the b's that start from negative infinity and stop at almost 1, and almost 1 uses a parenthesis. Now if there was an equal to there, please use a bracket. Bracket means I'm allowed to stand there. There's a point there for me to be at. It's included. Say so bracket is included, parenthesis means don't include that point. Everybody okay with 32? Okay, 33, let's go ahead and uh, let's do that one. So it becomes just like an equation for the most part. If you multiply or divide by negative, flip the symbol. Okay, so let's add 3 to both sides. We get negative 8x is greater than negative 32. Now, I'm going to divide by a negative here. Either circle your symbol, highlight your symbol, whatever you got to do that the next time we write it, we're going to flip it. And so we get x is less than 4. So we're going to have an open circle at 4 and shade to the left. So, the graph tells us what the interval is. We want to go from negative infinity. We always just travel along the, the number line from left to right. We're going to stop just before 4, or almost 4, and almost 4 gets a parenthesis. And 
Any questions about 33? Okay, let's go on and do 34. Um, okay, it's just an inequality. Solve it like you normally would. Let's subtract 0.6 from both sides. Let's add 10.6 to both sides. we get uh, that negative 0.4x is less than 30.4. Now, we're dividing by a negative, right? So what do we do? Flip the symbol the next time we write it. So circle it, highlight it, remind yourself, I'm going to write it the next time using a greater than symbol. So 30.1 divided by point, negative 0.4 is negative 75.24. Now it didn't say to graph it, but just taking a moment to graph one like this um, would be very helpful. Even if it's just a little quick little graph here, you would have an open circle and we would shade to the right. I'm sorry I didn't put an equal, which one the 37 there is. I'm like, there's none that are equal. And then uh, our answer this time starts just after 75.25, or almost 75.25 uses that parenthesis, and then it keeps going to infinity. Remember, it follows the number line from left to right. Okay, let's keep going. So 35 is a compound inequality. We want the x to be between two numbers. So let's um, get that x value alone by adding 6 to all three sides, three, <laughs> three pieces of the compound inequality. When we do that, we get that 5 is less than negative 3x, which is less than um, 11. And now we have to divide by negative 3. What do we do to the symbols? we got to switch them. And so we get negative 5 thirds is greater than x, which is greater than negative 11 thirds. Now, the reason we switch it is because of the fact that it switched the number line. It switched the direction. It kind of turns that whole thing. So normally it doesn't completely matter, but here we want to see less than, so let's turn it one more time. Let's put the 11 thirds here and the negative 5 thirds here. And you'll notice that that's number line order now. Negative 11 thirds is negative 3 point something, and then negative 5 thirds is negative 1 point something. So it's now following the number line correctly. So my answer for this one It's open circles on both and shade in between. Now, the interval is nice. It's just the starting point's negative 11 thirds, the ending point's negative 5 thirds. That's your answer. So the answer is negative 11 thirds to negative 5 thirds. This is my starting left end. This is my right end. And this means everything in between. Okay. Let's quickly do these last two, 36 and 37. Uh, absolute value less thans and absolute value greater thans are handled slightly differently. I think the easier one is 36. Okay, For 36, just rewrite the absolute value, drop it away. So just rewrite everything but the absolute value symbols. And we do have a positive and a negative case. This one is an intersection, an and. And that second case is stuck in it. It's going to end up being a between. So we can just stick the negative case on it. So if you have an absolute value less than, just stick the negative case on the other side. Absolute value less than, negative case is stuck to it. And now it becomes just like 39. We're going to add 5 to both sides. All sides, I guess. Divide by 2.
And that's our answer. We want all x's between negative 3 halves and 13 halves. Okay? Absolute value less than. Stick the negative case on it on the other side because it's technically an intersection. A 37 problem, an absolute value greater than, is not an intersection. It's a union or an or. So the two cases are independent of one another. So your first case, just write it without the absolute value. Then write the word or, and then write the absolute value as is, and we're going to flip all of that. So the negative case, because what does a negative do? It flips it. So that's going to be a less than or equal to negative 3. And then we're just going to solve. So solve each one independently. Here we're going to add 5, get 8, divide by 2, get 4. Here when we add 5, we get uh, 2. And then when we divide by 2, we get 1. The less than should come to the left of the uh, greater than. It should go on the right. Um, the only time that wouldn't happen is if, uh, like if there was a negative here, it would end up shading everything. But let's look at the final answer and then we're done. Test tomorrow, please study. We're going to have a closed in dot at, at the 1, shade to the left. Closed in dot at the 4, shade to the right. And how do we write our answer? Let me give you the final answer. We're going to have two intervals. One for each piece. The first one goes from negative infinity to 1 and includes it in a bracket. Then you're going to write the OR symbol. And then I'm going to go from 4 included in a bracket to infinity. Yes? Could you flip the, um, the inequality? Yes. So when we set these up, the first case, you just use the greater than. The second case, you always use the opposite of everything you see here. So flip the symbol and then flip the sign. So you'll notice that it became a less than and it became a negative. So flip both of those pieces. So you won't flip them when you divide um, Because this happened to be a positive value, we didn't have to flip them anymore. So remember, only if the multiplication or division is by a negative. So you usually, usually flip those just once, usually, most of the time. Any questions about what's going to be on the test? This is it. We're going to take two days because there's lots of stuff on it. It kind of is going to follow this order, not completely, but really close. So if you can do this, you're ready. The easiest way to study for a math is do it again. Can you do this without me? If you can do this without me, you're ready for the test. If you can't, you're not. So study, study, study.